Welcome to Migration Policy Institute. Great to have you here. Good to see Dimitri Papadimitriou, the founder of MPI, sitting back there. Um, we are uh, very pleased to have you here. And uh, we are live streaming this event. I'll give you some tips on that in a second for those out in the rest of the world that are not in this room. But very pleased to have our live stream audience with us as well as those of you here in the room. Um, welcome to uh, all of you to the discussion of Building Bridges, Not Walls, Migration, Displacement, and Education, Global Education Monitoring Report. Very important report that we're going to be talking about today. Um, you can tweet questions when we get to questions and answers to at Migration Policy. You can also use the hashtag MPI, MPI Discuss, or you can email events at migrationpolicy.org. Sorry, we don't have a WhatsApp channel yet, but get almost everything else. Um, I'd like to welcome you here today and to our distinguished speakers, Priya Joshi, who is the, uh, going to be presenting the report, the research officer at the Global Education Monitoring Report, Mandy Manning, great pleasure to have you here, Mandy, um, the National, National Teacher of the Year, who teaches English to newly arrived refugees and immigrant students in the Newcomer Center at Joel Ferris High School in Spokane, Washington, and congratulations, by the way. Yeah. Um, Mary Giovanoli, our good friend, Director of Refugee Council USA and former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Immigration Policy at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security from 2015-2017. Mary, good to have you here. And Joan Lombardi, who is now the Director of Early Opportunities and was the former and first Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2009 to 2011. Good to have you here. We at NPR are delighted to host the U.S. launch of the Global Education Monitoring Report, which continues which continues its assessment of progress towards the sustainable development goals on education. The report's focus on migration displacement this year is incredibly relevant, considering the record levels of displacement going on globally. There are 258 million international migrants, or one in every 30 people globally. And the education of their children, those who remain in the country of origin as well as those who travel, is a key investment for both countries of immigration and emigration and their future human capital. We at MPI, and particularly MPI's National Center on Immigrant Integration, which Marjorie McHugh leads so ably here and is really one of the, the crown jewels of MPI, um, have been doing world-class work on the educational needs of children from both refugee and immigrant families and how to most effectively prepare them for future success, both for themselves and the broader society. And for that reason, we are truly delighted and think it is fitting that UNESCO has asked us to co-host today's event among the several taking place worldwide to launch this year's GEM report. We'd like to thank our partners at the GEM Report and congratulate them on this important report. There are, I believe, copies of this available as well, Lisa, correct? Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Priya Joshi to present the findings from the Global Education Monitoring Report. Priya. I'll leave you. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Welcome to the launch of the 2019 Global Education Monitoring Report. Before sharing uh, some of the key findings of the, of the, and the recommendations featured in the report, I'd first like to thank our hosts, our panelists, uh, the speakers, and, for all, and to all of you for traveling uh, to this event. We are extremely grateful for your willingness uh, to share your experiences in addressing the education needs of people on the move. So the Global Education Monitoring Report has the mandate to monitor progress in education in the Sustainable Development Agenda, which is SDG 4. Fulfilling our mandate, the report has often shown the distance that the world will need to cover to reach the targets uh, agreed for 2030. And a key challenge is, the, uh, is whether we can fulfill the commitment to leave no one behind. Of course, as always, all of you know, Migrants and refugees and internally displaced people are among those groups who may be really severely left behind. Of course, they are a very varied group. Uh, there are people who, want to, who are trying to escape poverty or persecution. There are those who seek better education, who are just seeking employment opportunities or just security. And our report takes um, the widest possible interpretation of migration, uh, voluntary or forced. It covers internal migration where an estimated one in eight people live in a different province to the one they were born in. Apart from those who moved from villages to cities, uh, famously in China, there are hundreds of people for whom uh, migration is a way of life, um, culturally, like nomads and pastoralists, or as a result of economic compulsion, like seasonal workers. The report addresses international migrants who are nationals of another country living abroad, such as myself, I'm from Nepal, and I lived in the US for you know, eight, 15 years, and now I live in Paris. And um, they make up 
257 million, about one in 30 people. And of course, even that figure does not cover children who of immigrants, the so-called second generation, who also have many you know, different kinds of education needs. And last but not least, um, the report looks at the one in 80 people who have been displaced due to conflict or natural disaster, whether it's internally or across borders, as refugees or asylum so seekers. And the daunting prospect of displacement due to climate change is only briefly touched upon for the time being. But really, this is not a report on migration and displacement per se. It is a report on how these movements interact with education. It is about how teachers and education planners have to respond. It is about the needs that migrants and refugees have for education to thrive in their new homes and to feel like they belong. So migration and displacement can have both negative and positive effects on education. So let's just start with the challenges first. Internal migration can lead to millions of children being left behind. More than one in three children are left behind in rural China in 2015. Urbanization, fertility reduction, rural depopulation leads to all kinds of issues such as large scale rural school cons consolidation. In many middle income countries, there's been you know, severe consequences. Half of the rural schools have closed down in China and Russia in the last 10 to 15 years. And on the flip side, uh, where urban populations grow, you have growing slums, um, and education provision is really scarce. This is mostly in poorer Asian and African countries. International migration affects, especially affects sending countries' education systems, uh, which you know, is popularly known as the brain drain, uh, and particularly in some of the smaller countries. At least one in five skilled people emigrated from 27% of countries. And Despite the rhetoric, displacement particularly affects low-income countries, which account for 10% of the population, but 20% of the refugee population. And importantly, refugees, um, more than migrants, are of school age. Half of them are under 18. And on top of that, many of them arrive in host countries that already have poor education systems. But of course, a lot of us know that migration and displacement, and even displacement, can even represent an opportunity. Children, children who move from rural to air, urban areas often aspire to acquire more education. And in a context like Indonesia, the uh, migrants from rural Indonesia had three more years of education compared to uh, children who stayed behind. Children of international migrants also benefit. Children of Colombian immigrants to the United States had at least two more years of education than children who did not migrate. And of course, when we talk of international migrants, we're also talking about students abroad, which is the case of at least 60% of students in half of the countries. And refugees, of course, may be leaving, behind, leaving their homes behind, but they may also leave their insecurity behind. There were 12,700 attacks on schools between 2013 and 2017 in conflict-affected countries. So that was about how migration affects you know, education. The other side, there's also the fact that, in turn, education is a potent factor shaping migration flows. The higher the education level, the higher the probability of migration. Those with tertiary education were twice as likely to migrate from villages to cities, and five times as likely to emigrate abroad as those with primary education. And a point that's often missing in public debates, but you know, of course, may be evident to the, the audience here, is that quite often immigrants are more educated than natives, uh, even in countries that do not pursue selective immigration policies. And education is a critical, even if it is a contested factor, shaping attitudes towards migration. A 2017 survey from across 140 countries showed that the higher the level of education, the higher the level of openness to immigration levels, uh, staying the same or increasing. But of course, education's role is potentially much more important than those relationships might suggest. An inclusive education system can address causes of tension by helping host and immigrant communities interact and live together, or by providing equal opportunities. Um, it can help immigrants and refugees realize their potential, which is often wasted. And, it can, and by doing all this, it can ultimately help immigrants and refugees earn a living and support communities uh, back home through remittances and other mechanisms. An analysis that we did in the report shows that if the cost of remitting money abroad fell from 7% to the SDG target of 3%, a billion dollars could be generated for education. 
So because of all these important relationships and all of this you know, discussion around the importance of education, um, education-related commitments have made their way into the two global compacts on migrants and refugees that are being signed by almost all countries around in the world this year. But there's very little detail on how these commitments should be achieved. What are the priority actions? The report makes seven recommendations that I will now take you through. First, the governments need to protect the right to education of all people on the move. Just two years after the New York Declaration, where countries committed to provide education to refugees within three months, one and a half billion school days of refugees have been lost. So countries from Australia to Hungary, from Indonesia to Mexico, are still providing limited to no education to asylum-seeking children in detention. Countries need to support, protect migrants and refugees' right to education, regardless of ID documents or residence status. For instance, Jordan tackled this issue after initial obstacles by allowing Syrian refugee children to enter public schools without ID cards. Education and immigrant laws, immigration laws need to be consistent with each other. There should not be too much discretion in interpreting laws at the school level or the local level. And we need to put formal processes in place to inform migrants and refugees of their right to education and to inform their ability to respond to the violation of this right. Second, migrant and refugee children need to be included in the national education system. And this, of course, takes many forms. Turkey has committed to include all Syrian children in public schools by 2020, as you can see in this graph. Refugees should spend minimal time in schools that do not follow the national curriculum. Eight of the top 10 hosting countries, including refugees and national, include refugees in national education systems, including countries such as Chad and Ethiopia. Immigrants should not be segregated. They should not be concentrated in specific schools, as in so many European countries still today. They should spend as little time as possible in like, initial preparatory classes, because inclusion also means interacting with peers. And they should not be separated into slower, often vocational school tracks, uh, which compromise their future opportunities, which is seen in some US contexts. And of course, including migrants and refugees in national education systems is only the beginning. We need a plan to respond to their specific needs. And not all countries do this successfully. This graph shows the countries in Southern and Eastern Europe, who are highlighted in red, are struggling to prioritize migration and refugee needs. So they're the ones in red, they're unfavorable integration indicators. Countries need to provide language programs, and I'm sure our panelists will speak to this uh, much more intensively. They need to provide accelerated education programs where trajectory education has been interrupted. The Norwegian Refugee Council, for instance, runs an accelerated learning program in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, uh, where the curriculum, the eight-year curriculum has been shortened to four years. Refugees need support to overcome cost barriers. Uh, cash transfers in Lebanon increase attendance by about 20%. And adult migrants um, can use financial education to help manage remittances. Fourth, countries need to grapple with their curricula and textbooks. Of course, this is a very contentious issue, but education can challenge prejudices and help develop skills for living together. But only a quarter of high-income countries have fully included multicultural education, and a little over two-thirds have done so at least partially. Still, you know, 81% of those who answered the Eurobarometer survey agreed that school materials should include information on ethnic diversity. Adapting curricula and textbooks should involve respecting past and current history and diversity, recognizing the contributions of immigrants and refugees, promoting openness to multiple perspectives, and encouraging critical approaches. The key to these challenges is, of course, you know, supporting teachers to take on this complex responsibility. But we see teachers, teachers face enormous challenges. About three quarters of teachers in Syria had no training on how to provide psychosocial support. It is necessary for teachers to have the training to deal with diversity, to confront stereotypes and discrimination, to recognize to recognize stress and trauma and refer those in need to specialists. It is necessary to recognize, of course, you know, 
it feels like a lot of burdens that you know, we keep assigning to teachers. It's also important to recognize the hardships that teachers face um, and, and the conditions under which some teachers are expected to work. In Iraq, there was fragmented support to internally displaced teachers, which led to pay disparities and tensions around pay. The education cluster brought all partners uh, working in the country together to coordinate incentive structures um, to help the process along. The sixth point here is about um, highly skilled individuals. Unfortunately, often the skills of migrants are not fully deployed despite their potential to contribute to their host communities and societies. Among those with tertiary education in high income countries, immigrants were often were much more likely to be overqualified for the jobs than natives. To address those challenges, it is necessary to reform institutions to uh, make the recognition of qualifications earned abroad more efficient and to streamline and simplify systems for certifying skills acquired informally. Germany is offering opportunities to identify and evaluate occupational competencies of undocumented migrants. And finally, last but not least on the recommendations, financing education for migrants and refugees of course has cost implications. In the case of immigrants, um, we did um, a small um, fiscal analysis and we find that the medium to long term fiscal impact uh, of migration is quite low. Taking, after taking into account the services that migrants use uh, and the taxes they pay, on the whole, the cost does not exceed 1% you know, of GDP. Uh, but much more could be done to target funds where they are needed the most. In the case of refugees, the report has estimated that 800 million was spent on their education in 2016. Uh, it's roughly equally spent between the immediate response humanitarian aid in blue and the long-term response development aid in purple, and the rest of it is still you know, the gap uh, in financing. Planning for both you know, humanitarian and development needs have to be done jointly with the government in charge. Uganda is proving to be a nice example of how collaborations are improving, and the momentum around education can, cannot wait, which is the new uh, funding source for education in emergencies should also be used. And you know, an important thing for, for these uh, challenges of education is that it's not just an education challenge, multi-sector planning should uh, include education. So now that we talked about funding in the education in emergency type situation, it brings to mind the wider challenges of financing education. This is something that we've tracked since the report has been around in 2002. Uh, analysis for this report has always shown vast disparities across countries. Low income and high income, for instance, right now, low income and high income countries have about the same population of school age uh, children. But if the former, the low income countries absorb about 4.5% of the global spending on education, um, the high income countries get the lion's share, 65% of the global share of education. And another thing that we have highlighted, highlighted recently is that spending is also quite uh, unequal in other ways. Households, you know, out-of-pocket expenditures are far, far, far higher in low-income countries than in higher and middle-income countries. And what we found is that, you know, when we talk about a, a core sort of education indicator like schooling attainment or completion, Finance is an important issue, and we, we see this because if we think about the big global goal of the last 15 years, it was primary completion. The mobilization of the international community to increase aid in the late 90s was one of the factors that led to an acceleration of completion in the early 2000s. But then the financial crisis happened, which led to aid stagnation. And as a result of that, primary completion rates have also stagnated um, at less than 90% since the late 2000s. Today, our agenda, the SDG agenda, is far more ambitious. One of the ambitions is to you know, expand the, uh, the discussion to completing secondary schooling. Our analysis has found that only 49% complete secondary school globally. The ratio is much worse in um, low-income countries, only 18% complete, um, complete uh, secondary schooling, and actually is only 1% among the poorest girls in the, in the world. But you know, it's not just a low-income situation. In, in the, even in high-income countries in Europe, young people from migrant backgrounds are twice as likely to leave school early as natives. 
And of course, you know, we don't really just want people to attend school and finish school. It's about whether they're learning at at least a minimum uh, minimum level. First generation immigrant students in OECD countries were a third less likely than natives to achieve basic skills in reading, math, and science in 2015. In middle income and non OECD high income countries, progress is slow. On average, the share of grade four students reaching minimum levels has only increased by about a percentage point per year over the last 15 years. So, very slow progress. And of course, you know, low income countries start at an even lower starting point. In Sierra Leone, Evidence from UNICEF shows that among children, only 16% had basic reading skills and only 12% had basic numeracy skills. So, of course, you know, the SDG monitoring framework is not just about attending school and, you know, reaching a minimum learning level. This was, you know, I pre we presented just this much before um, in the interest of time. But what is really important is that the SDG for monitoring framework, the ambition of it is what matters for sustainable development. It is about you know, completing school, learning as adults, learning as kids, learning how to live sustainably, learning how to live together. It is about so many more things. So it is vital that we continue to focus on SDG4, like, you know, adhere to these ideas. It is vital that we all continue to focus on refugees and migrants who may be falling behind. So that's the end of the presentation. Please do share the messages of this report um, at the link on the slide, you will find uh, report materials in multiple languages and formats. We also have a couple of uh, interactive uh, short videos which will be made available, and one of these um, we might be showing right now. But thank you for listening. Yeah. Our world is experiencing the biggest migration of people in history, from villages to cities, and from one country to another. Some choose to move. Because of the difficulty of living in the Philippines, my parents felt compelled to leave. Others are forced. People on the move do not leave their rights to an education behind. I believe that it is a constitutional right for a child to be educated, and we need to respect that right. We've had parents arrested for deportation, which obviously affected the school and the population. I'm afraid that one day out of the blue, my dad will be gone or my mom will be gone. It is a constitutional obligation to not abridge access to public education for any child, irregardless of immigration status. Migrants and refugees have unique education needs. El reto más grande para los niños refugiados cuando ingresan al sistema escolar nuestro está precisamente en empezar a acoplarse a ese mundo escolar que es muy diferente. But when education systems can adapt to these needs, they have the potential to transform lives. Due to the overwhelming number of students who wanted places in high school, that is why we had to be innovative enough to come up with a model that could take in more students. As we adapt our education systems, seasonal migrants and nomads should also be included in the picture. As we move forward, we need teachers who are trained to support migrant and displaced students as they adapt to new education systems in their host communities. Aquí aquí nos nos reunimos con este grupo de docentes de aquí de Colombia y le vamos explicando un poco la situación de Venezuela. Estos proyectos de sensibilización de sensibilización nos está ayudando a nosotros como docentes. We foreign teachers bring our culture. We can bring different ideas. We can bring different views and things on, on society. By ignoring the education of migrants and refugees, we lose out on human potential. It's only through education that we are able to impart skills to learners we are able to restore hope to these students. 
सगळ्यांना भरपूर स्वप्न असतात मला पण स्वप्न आहे मला पण खूप शिकायचं आहे मोठं व्हायचं आहे पुढे जाऊन सी आय डी ऑफिसर बनायचं आहे Every person has the right to an education. Working together, we must ensure that no one is left behind. Great. Well, Priya, I must say, oh wait, I'm supposed to announce myself for folks who are online. So, um, welcome to everyone who's joining us via the webcast. Um, I'm Margie McHugh, Director of MPI's National Center on Immigrant Integration Policy as Andrew said earlier. And uh, Priya, I don't think there could be anyone in the room or watching who's not awed by the scope of the report or the ambition of its purpose. So mm -hmm. congratulations. And then the thought that you only had 20 minutes to put something this big and thick, it's, it's probably almost as big a challenge as, uh, as the team you were trying to uh, ride herd on to get it done. But uh, sincerely, congratulations. And we're so pleased to have you here today. And uh, I want to welcome everyone who's here in the room. Uh, we know that you come from a very uh, diverse set of intersections with the issues, so I'm a little intimidated about trying to take on the Q&A portion of this, but we're going to do our best to, uh, to really run the, um, run the gamut of, uh, of issues that are involved here. And I think we have a terrific set of additional uh, respondents here to, uh, to kind of bring this down to the U.S. level and connect it uh, to what folks who work in the context here might be able to do in support of the, um, the many issues that you speak about in the report. So um, we're going to, the, the way we'll do this is these are not presentations by the other panelists. I'll just ask a few questions so that you can get a sense of the breadth of their experience. We'll open up some other uh, topics that uh, Priya didn't have a chance to touch on just so that we'll sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, establish more or less uh, the four corners of the conversation before we start taking questions. And uh, in the room, we'll have a microphone to go around. We just ask that you, uh, that you uh, uh, state your name and, and where you're from before you ask. For folks who are joining via the webcast, we have a few ways that you can be in touch with us with questions. You can tweet questions to at Migration Policy. Uh, you, could also, you, you may also use the has hashtag MPI Discuss, or you can email us at events at migrationpolicy.org. Uh, so, um, so many thanks to our terrific panelists and a few of them that we sprang on you, but I think you'll be very happy with everything they have to, um, to offer. It just turned out to be a really rough week with Thanksgiving travel and everything else that was going on, um, but it was our great good fortune um, that, uh, that not only are we getting the 2018 National Teacher of the Year, we have to find out from you maybe afterwards how you beat out maybe three and a half million other people for that. Uh, but, um, uh, and then also um, just delighted that, um, uh, that Joan Lombardi could be with us. She actually, uh, many of you know her in the U.S. context because of the role she played uh, for many years at Health and Human Services and uh, continues to work both internationally and in the domestic context around expanding uh, early childhood education and capacity building for systems there. And then Mary Giovanoli, who's uh, with Refugee Council USA, which is the uh, umbrella group uh, here in the U.S. for refugee resettlement agencies, refugee protection, I should say, as well as resettlement agencies, and, uh, and has been a leading voice for many years or, during a very distinguished uh, career uh, in the immigration and refugee field. So um, I thought I would start with you, Mary, because it's hard um, it's hard not to speak about uh, the context in the U.S. that this report is coming into. Things are very different uh, over the last year or two in terms of some of the difficulties that uh, refugee protection and resettlement agencies who operate out of the U.S. and in the U.S. are facing in terms of a very different political climate uh, that they're operating in. And, um, and, and very often they provide leadership uh, in, an, in an international context as well. So I just thought it might be helpful if you could um, speak a little bit about that, especially because I think in the DC context um, and in the immigrant field, we tend to think kind of myopically just about refugee resettlement per se in the US, but the report is, uh, I believe, speaking to uh, a number of issues that are really quite familiar um, to what we traditionally only think of as refugee resettlement agencies. No, I, I, I think you framed that well. Um, thank you for um, having uh, 
asked me to participate in this. I'm really glad to be here because I think you're exactly right that the concept of refugee resettlement um, has sometimes been uh, uh, siloed a bit or um, stovepiped um, from some of the broader uh, challenges that face uh, the United States with respect to immigration generally, um, international migration and protection issues, and uh, it, it's really a moment in time for those of us who work in that field to, to start to weave all the strands together. And one of the things to me that was fascinating about this report was that um, by assessing education in the context of uh, a displaced and uh, on the move world, um, you offer a different lens to ask a lot of the same questions that people are asking. And, and you know, you could do this, you could do this in healthcare, you could do this in any of the other, you know, areas where where the, the UN is, is really focusing on, on issues that of concern globally. But I think education is particularly useful because it really helps us drill down on the needs that people have when they are relocated, whether it's, you know, short term, like the folks who um, have lost their homes in the California fires, or midterm, like folks who are displaced for a while but are able to go home, or, or long term, like many of the refugees um, around the world today. And so, uh, two things, because I know we're supposed to try to keep it short. The Refugee Council USA itself is um, composed of the nine national resettlement agencies uh, that currently have contracts with the federal government to do the actual physical resettlement of uh, refugees here in the U.S. However, um, many of many of our, our members in, in that category also do work abroad and are involved in, in projects that address, you know, both identification of refugees and processing of refugees abroad, but also doing work in camps and elsewhere on issues like education. Um, some of our members are not resettlement agencies, but organizations like Refugee Point that are totally focused on working abroad and are thinking about these these kinds of s situations. And then other members are, you know, more traditionally advocacy groups like Human Rights First or Amnesty International. Um, and some are hybrids like the Center for Victims of Torture that both uh, provide certain services for particularly affected groups of individuals, some of whom are refugees, some of whom are, are coming from other categories, but also do, you know, very important advocacy work. And then we have groups like Refugee Center Online, which is a great example of a really creative approach to trying to reach refugees where they are, focused domestically, but, you know, using online resources to try to educate in a wide variety of ways. So I think that, you know, in the context of, of, of this report, the question that I'm going to be really interested in exploring is how looking at these issues through the lens of education, um, which is one of the sort of primary responsibilities in the initial resettlement of refugees is making sure that the kids are getting into school and that they're registered and that the parents understand how to get them there and what a locker is and all those kinds of things, how that actually is a, a touchstone for any number of other issues that are very local in nature but actually reflect the um, sort of deep-seated issues we're facing right now about how to, how to um, welcome people in this country and ensure that that welcoming is something that people feel is sort of a two-way street, that we gain as much from the welcoming as the people who are being welcomed. So I'll leave it at that for now. Oh, Mandy, that makes me want to ask you five other things. <laughs> than, uh, than, um, but, um, but so I want to make sure that we bring in, since a recent experience in the U.S. was the arrival of, uh, of many uh, unaccompanied minors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from Central America, and I know that we here at MPI were sort of surprised that school districts that we thought were just for decades now working in a, in a really uh, productive way with immigrant and refugee students were really stumbling mm -hmm. on how to handle late arriving um, students in particular. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it, um, it, at the time, we, we th quickly tried to bring a lot of them together just to talk about what were some of their practices, but it really opened our eyes to the, um, the issues that many schools um, still face in terms of uh, capacity building for teachers that are in sort of when you get to the middle and high school years, um, how, do you really, how do you really work on having teachers, uh, all teachers participate in helping, um, helping kids succeed. So we wonder, just given your position, your sort of mm -hmm. specialist position, um, uh, and since so much of the report speaks to capacity building for schools mm -hmm. being able to 
uh, work well with children. Just what are some of your observations, I guess, in terms of um, what you think is, um, what, you, what you see has been needed or the types of professional development that, um, that you'd like to flag that you think schools are, are attempting to work on or need to work on even in the U.S. context um, to have, to have old, I guess I would say older arriving children mm -hmm. um, be able to really meet that goal that Priya was talking about, about being able to actually get into the academic content and uh, succeed in graduating. Right. So, um, well, I think one of the main uh, issues is that when a new, brand new English language learner comes into a school, there's this assumption that uh, limited language acquisition or limited language ability is equivalent to lack of knowledge. And so that becomes, they become conflated with one another when really most of the students have knowledge that they have already come to the school with. They just lack the language to, uh, to articulate what they already know. And so um, the most important thing is that because we often believe that the role and responsibility of an educator is to teach language and to teach content and to teach academics, but really especially with brand new immigrants and refugees, it's that welcoming and the connecting and the relationships and the being open to having brand new students come into, um, into our programs and not seeing them through the deficits, but seeing them for their assets. And so the most important training, there's two really important pieces to training that I think are, are important for all educators. And number one is cultural responsiveness training. Because this is the training that's going to help them to view these brand new newcomers through an asset lens. It's going to be able to help them recognize the benefits of having new immigrants, migrants, and refugee and asylum seekers into the school because it not only benefits, you know, the migrant, but it all, or the immigrant. It all it's really even more so beneficial to the other students within the school. Um, so that cultural training piece and then trauma training, because that is one thing that I was happy was addressed in just even this little snip because uh, we are as educators expected to tackle a lot of things that we aren't necessarily prepared through for our, through our um, education preparation programs um, and, and helping students process trauma is one of those things. Uh, and our immigrant asylum seeker, refugee, all of the, the variety of students who come to us come with a variety of, of traumatic experiences that they need to work through. So I would say that those are the most important elements because it's not about knowing exactly how to teach an English language learner, it's being open to doing so. Great, thank you. So Joan, I think a lot of folks um, maybe hearing about this report would be thinking primarily in terms of elementary and secondary education since those are the formal uh, and, and usually mandatory parts of most um, school systems and, and policy making. Uh, um, for education, I mean, obviously post-secondary too, but um, but really K-12 is what um, what we often think about and what the report is very much focused on. But there is an early childhood right. chapter in there, and you had something to do with it. So um, I just um, uh, you devoted so much of your career um, to trying to um, make more visible the opportunities uh, in the early education space, and so. Maybe if you could say a little bit about the importance uh, just of early education being sure. there in the report. Well, thanks, Margie, and thanks to MPI and your whole team for your continued focus on <clears throat> the immigration issues. Um, I think you have made a major contribution, and I see Dimitri here. I just want <clears throat> to start by thanking you and uh, Priya to the whole GEM team. Um, I think we all wait for this report every year to come out because you provide us the data that we so need. And I especially want to thank you for the term bridge because I think um, that is the best metaphor for what education is for the immigrant and migrant community. And I, I think it was the perfect term. Um, I know it was for my own family, um, and I'm sure it was for your family. That's the reason people migrate often is to seek a better education for the children. So thanks, um, Margie, for letting me talk about young children. There is no other group that's uh, 
more vulnerable to the issues of poverty, conflict, and forced displacement than children, particularly ch children under five. And for too long, their needs have been invisible. Um, what's been interesting lately is, unfortunately, we've seen the impact that uh, war has had on children on the front pages of our papers. Not the most pleasant things to see, that's for sure. Um, but it has been more visible through the coverage that we've seen, both in war-torn countries, but also in the unfortunate separation of children from their families here and around the world. Um, we know that um, one in 2015, about one out of eight babies were born, 16 million babies were born in conflict zones. Imagine having your baby in a conflict zone. Um, and these are not temporary. They're protracted um, uh, efforts, uh, uh, protracted situations that can last the lifetime of a child. So that's kind of the context. Um, you know, here in the US, we've got about a quarter of children that have at least one foreign born fa pa parent, like I did. Um, and so these are the issues that are facing very young children and their families. What we do know is that the early years have a profound impact on learning, on behavior, and on health. And it is those early experiences that impact the developing brain, the architecture of the brain, the emotions of children that will last forever. Um, recently, the American Academy of Pa Pediatrics um, released a statement where, in where, which they said armed conflict directly and indirectly affects children's physical, mental, and behavioral health. It can affect every organ system, and it impacts, and the impacts can persist throughout the life, life course of, of a child and into their adulthood. So this is a serious issue. It's um, an issue that not only affects young children in armed conflict, but it's the trauma of separation. It's the trauma of poverty. It's the fear that I think someone mentioned of uh, having your parent not there when someone is supposed to pick you up um, from a child care program um, at the end of the day, which we've heard stories of. At the same time, on a more positive note, we know that early intervention can make a difference. It can be that buffer that helps at least some to mitigate the um, impacts that we're seeing of poverty and trauma, especially if it focuses on supporting the family, which is the place where children grow up, families and communities. The reality is, however, that we, may, we face a lot of challenges. Rarely are young children talked about in a panel like this. Rarely are they included in a report on education. Um, I will, although that's changing because we know that the education goal now includes a target for young children. But we face a lot of challenges. We have very limited data um, on numbers. We have serious challenges with regard to funding. And early childhood calls for an integrated approach across health, education, child protection. Yet we lack coordination, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Right, it's sort of two types of uh, two areas trying to get themselves together. There's no real early childhood system, and we also um, there's the refugee and immigrant integration piece of it too that both need some work to right. have them come together. Um, so Priya, we just wanted you to catch your breath for a minute, but <laughs> but I think that we might want to. Um, um, shift a little bit um, to to opening up a bit of a conversation about uh, sort of the the goals that uh, that Gem and um, UNESCO have for um, the release of the of the report in the U.S. For example, how do you make the connection between mm -hmm. this um, expansive set of goals and the the scope of the report around the world um, to a U.S. audience in terms of what might be the how to bring it um, to a U.S. audience to think about what they might do uh, in terms of being supportive of some of the um, uh, the goals and um, efforts that you laid out. Well, thank you for that question. And thank you for your feedback, um, all of your inputs. I think, um, as you said, Margaret, it's precisely that. That is what we do. We do a global report. We're talking about 
hospital to attend to us on behalf of the court of order and then to provide a situation of what's happening in the world. But it, and as a result of that, you know, when you have to come up with recommendations of this nature, um, a lot of this is implicit, you know, that what do we, it, it's implicit and uh, sometimes a bit direct about what we want um, the U.S. to take from this. Of course, we speak to the exclusions uh, that the U.S. has, you know, instituted in the recent past, um, you know, undocumented migrants and, you know, the issues of, you know, DACA not being, you know, all of these. So, I mean, we speak to the, the sort of uh, concrete barriers to education that, ha that are more recent. But we also, of course, recognize that the U.S., um, having had such a large, long migration history, there are all kinds of migrant education programs that have been around since the early, I think, the mid-60s even. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we recognize that. So I feel like if you look at our text, you'll see that the U.S. is there interspersed because, of course, it is a nation of migrants. What I think is very important from an SDG sort of perspective is to think about, you know, the core issue of inclusion. You know, when we talk about inclusion in education systems, you have the, the foundational things like barriers, you know, make sure that people actually have access to education. Getting an education, because at the end of the day, um, as at least as people who are in education, it is the most cost-effective way not to waste human potential. You know, even if you, if there is that palpable fear of migrants, it is a way not to let it. You know, continue. Uh, what do you call it? It's the economic argument. It is the most cost-effective way not to have um, you know challenges in the future. Let's say. <clears throat> To put it, you know, in the least, in the most diplomatic way possible, um, but I think <coughs> that when we think of the SDGs or global issues, it's collective. We are all in it together. The U.S. has things that need to be done locally, you know, and and what we see from, especially, I think, for a local, um, for a local um, U.S.-based audience, the U the European examples will probably have the most resonance because you know the Europe is dealing with all kinds of um, integration um, challenges. Uh, it's a diverse uh, set of approaches. There's you know, approaches to, um, that, that range from you know, shifting more towards assimilation, like in the Netherlands, you know, the, not, the what should not be done sort of examples. You also have examples of you know, parallel education systems, like Greece continues to have a somewhat parallel system for refugees. You know, again, the not should not be done sort of category. Ireland has uh, something that is very ambitious. It's, uh, it's an integrated education policy um, that I think was um, from 2010 to 2015, a massive sort of range of policies that were implemented, um, including language support, 100 million to, for school, edu for school um, language support, 10 million for adult language support, um, efforts to sort of really remove um, cost, you know, cost as a barrier, efforts to really improve teacher, um, teacher training, efforts to, uh, and also like to, I think uh, schools were forced to um, make transparent their admission policies. You know, all kinds of things that we think are barriers and ways to segregate. Um, and what, and, and uh, data and monitoring sort of, you know, efforts as well, one of, one of the few countries that has a fairly comprehensive policy for, <clears throat> for data. And what, what, what it shows is that in PISA, the, the big sort of OECD um, analysis on learning outcomes, uh, it is one of the countries that has the smallest native to immigrant gap. And it also is one of the countries that has, has the smallest uh, well-being gap, let's say, you know, like security, well-being, um, belonging, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, is, it, ha it does have that narrative. Of course, no country has, you know, we don't do the kind of analysis where you can have causal discussion. You know, in early childhood, you can have sometimes real causal discussions. But this is what you see in policy. Like you can actually see an island where something real is hap has happened uh, as a result of a real focus on education, even with a financial crisis and, you know, mm -hmm. whatnot. Like, you know, money is core, you know, in these issues. And I think so that is the kind of local action we would hope that the U.S. or, you know, people working in the U.S. would be inspired by. And of course, there are several other uh, interspersed um, examples. One of them, I think, on early childhood was about um, Germany investing 400 million for early childhood refugee-related work, but, you know, abroad. And so that takes me to the... Um, the global discussion, as a donor for education, as you know, some as a country that invests in other people's education, you have lots happening in the most, uh, in the largest refugee populations uh, of the world. You know, uh, countries like Chad, like Uganda, like Ethiopia, are investing in making sure that their education systems are more inclusive. So I think if you care and if you think that you know, uh, if you th if, if the idea is that you know, let's. Uh, 
let's not have an overpopulation of you know migrants in the the higher income world europe or i mean we have to support policies that are in poor countries that are so resource challenged uh, so that you know they can have a more inclusive systems in place so there's the local actions that can be taken there's the global actions that be, will be taken and i think we don't do enough of this but there's also the local initiatives at the city level etc which are much more that you know the us should be taking a much more inspiration from because of course as such, as a, such a decentralized context is not just about national level policies our report because it is the un you know report it has much more of a national flavor to it but the us of course is so complex and such a decentralized system so you know what cities do of course matter a lot for education mm -hmm. so these are some of the thoughts you know i mean there is of course a lot more peppered in there including teacher competencies and uh, yeah. um, you know But, but also a lot is happening on the other side, you know, so a lot is happening on the positive and a lot is happening on the negative. Where do we draw inspiration from? 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 As the community that, you know, cares about these issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that sure gives us a lot to talk about. So, um, so, uh, so Priya, I was thinking as you were speaking that in a way, um, you know, we have like a, a few thousand islands, you know, scattered across the United mm -hmm. States in a sense that mm -hmm. um, that it's one of the things that really bedevils um, education policy making, that it's so much driven um, by uh, state and local policy and then the mm -hmm. actions, as right. you know, of yeah. local school districts and the like. And uh, and so I even remember it when I used to, when I worked in New York City, we had a thousand public schools and we would say we have probably, um, you know, several hundred of the best schools in the U.S. Um, for immigrants and several hundred of the worst schools mm -hmm. just in our own, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, school district there. Uh, but so, um, so Mary, this is an issue for you all uh, because, um, because it really, you know, I think it has been shocking to a lot of folks in the um, refugee world, the way resettlement has um, been destabilized and become more controversial. And interestingly, Priya, again, back to you, I think um, some of us trace that to the fact that resettlement moved outside of some of our biggest historic gateway states and into a lot of the uh, parts of the country that really don't have much of a history with um, uh, immigrant and refugee diversity. They don't have some of the systems developed. So in a sense, I think we'd say that um, integration capacity building really matters in a lot of places. But so, so Mary, you, got a, you have a lot you could respond to there. There's both the <laughs> The, the how to think about the U.S. role from an international perspective and the, the, you know, the aid dollars and our role with a number of the international, uh, key international agencies, but then also the domestic piece of it. What, what sort of, um, I guess, opportunities um, do you see in either uh, as folks try and digest the report and, and look at it from uh, both the, the point of view of domestic and international focused actors here in the U.S.? Well, you're absolutely right that, that this conversation sparks a lot of different things. So I'm going to try to, to hone in on a few things. First of all, I, it's probably um, very common knowledge now. But just in case, you know, the refugee um, resettlement program in the United States has been significantly destabilized in the last few years. We went from a, a, a commitment um, in the last year of the Obama administration to admitting 110,000 refugees to this year, um, a presidential determination that would only admit 30,000 refugees, um, and a lot of politics and a lot of um, really, really ugly uh, rhetoric about the threat of, of, of people um, in this context. And uh, that's destabilizing in a number of ways. It's not just the reduction of uh, admissions of, of refugees themselves and therefore the impact on those individual lives that we may or may not be able to, you know, um, help or, or sponsor by bringing here, but it has repercussions on the international and on the domestic side. On the domestic side, as the numbers go down, particularly so dramatically, it um, undermines and destabilizes the work that's done at the national, at the state, at the local level to continue to build capacity and to maintain capacity to resettle folks. And, and uh, as, as Margie and Priya both mentioned, the, the concept of welcoming and integrating and just, just 
engaging people in all the various pieces of the puzzle that helps bring someone, particularly someone who has often been traumatized or has, you know, potentially grown up in a refugee camp to, to adjust to the, to the U.S. and to, to feel um, that they're part of the community is, is, you know, incredibly, it's a lot of work. And it takes a lot of expertise. And many of our resettlement, um, you know, partners at the state and local level, you know, they employ any number of, of people who are former refugees themselves mm -hmm. with, you know, language skills and other things to help continue to facilitate that. And so when the numbers drop, it just starts to, to stabilize the entire process. And I know Mandy can speak to this a great deal more about the impact in her own classroom and in the, in the programs in Spokane. But also, there's a, there's a huge international component, obviously, because resettlement is aimed at resettling the most vulnerable of refugees and there are not um, there are there are not enough slots in the world for all of the resettlement needs that exist but historically the US has been a leader in uh, in resettling and even then at our highest point you know the numbers don't don't even match the, the needs. But what they did was set a standard for other countries to, to aspire to mm -hmm. and to follow and provide several types of assistance to those countries that are the most, um, you know, the, 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 the true refugee receiving countries and the host countries. It really creates an opportunity to um, provide support, even if some of it's symbolic, to show that we are in this together yeah. and that we are welcoming people and we're not rejecting people. And yet at the same time, we do and we have always provided a fairly high level of support to folks in, in those communities. And um, what's happening on both ends, frankly, is that we are kind of um, backpedaling from our international commitments and we are sending a message to the world that uh, refugee resettlement isn't important. We use the rhetoric that, well, that's because we're providing additional assistance in the receiving countries, but in fact, the numbers, the, the, the financial support hasn't, hasn't grown, mm -hmm. as it's been said, but also that's not enough. That's just not enough. You have to have an international and a domestic component to really make this work and to, to address this issue. Two things, though, that are really important, I think, um, that with respect to cities, so much of the creative work that happens on integration and welcoming happens at the, at the city and state level, and we recognize that and are trying to work with our partners around the country on that. But cities are also sort of stepping up and saying, well, if the current administration isn't going to play ball, say, in the global compact and potentially now in the refugee um, context as well, we're going to step in. And so there's a number of cities like New York and Los Angeles who are, are going to be at the, the, the global conference on migration um, uh, adoption of the Global Compact in December. And I think that's one of the critical places where there's a lot of opportunity for us to take sort of the lessons learned in this particular report and work with the cities to help lift up pieces that that matter. And the other thing that I think is really, really important that um, speaks to the underlying issues of xenophobia and, and, and fear that have governed a lot of refugee policy in the last two years is the report very critically notes that teaching our history mm -hmm. and teaching the history of migration and the way that each everybody has a story, everybody has an origin story, and particularly in the U.S., one that is almost inherently an immigration story, is an opportunity both to create sort of a level playing field for, for thinking about issues, but what I thought was really interesting was that it heightens the critical thinking skills. Yeah. And critical thinking skills are to me sort of the underlying issue of any policy movement. How do you help people just think more uh, holistically, strategically, analyze the facts versus the fictions to come to conclusion? You obviously can't do that without education, but we need to factor that into everything we're doing in the context of, of refugee resettlement and the, the policies and programs we're using to advance it. Mm -hmm. So Mandy, um, I hear you yeah. amening over mm -hmm. here for, for a lot of what um, mm -hmm. a lot of what Mary was saying. So do you want to, there's obviously the institutional level mm -hmm. responses, the political responses, but uh, we always say the army is out there every day in classrooms. Okay. And so um, how, how does this hit your ear in terms of, uh, or speak to your experiences in terms of how um, on the front lines, um, schools and teachers are 
first of all, able to respond. There was a, it was a little bit in the video, and I think in some of the remarks here, uh, to the more recent fears around deportation. Right. Um, for students, obviously schools, uh, for the most part, um, operate under pretty strict policies. Mm -hmm. Um, and and even um, uh, even enforcement authorities um, uh, usually I would say generally respect not enforcing on school grounds, but there's still tremendous fear from families um, and students uh, in schools. Uh, and then um, uh, and then there's just sort of the broader range of issues related to um, uh, cultural diversity and right. welcoming of immigrants. So do you want to say uh, maybe speak a little bit to what it's like to? Uh, respond to some of that at the classroom level? Right. So, um, yes, in the last couple of years, there's been a dramatic shift in how the safety and security that our immigrant students feel in our schools because of all of the rhetoric that's happening in the media and, and through the current um, administration and with everything that's happening with the immigration services, you know, enforcement. And so we, I've had kids come to me and ask me when they're going to have to leave. I've, I've had kids come and ask me if, if their families are safe, things like that. And in schools, obviously, we're not allowed to ask or know for sure anybody's status. Um, but we, we do understand that it, it, regardless, regardless of their status, all of our immigrant refugee asylum seeking students are fearful because they aren't sure what will happen in the near future. And so some of the steps that we need to take is, number one, this is just a uh, nuts and bolts thing. We need to make sure that we're maintaining our programs of support, regardless of the numbers of our students. Because I can tell you in the Newcomer Center where I teach, um, in the last year of the Obama administration, I had my largest numbers with 33 students in the first semester and 26 in the second semester. And last year I had 12, no, 15 in the first semester and only five in the second semester. And this year we're starting with, um, we started with our lowest number ever in the fall, which was uh, five. And it has now grown to 13, but again, um, we're seeing a lot different uh, type of student because of what we're seeing in terms of refugees. I, I think maybe two of our new students are refugees. Uh, and so and so that makes me anticipate that in the fall my numbers will be even lower. So then that uh, causes a concern that they would then defund the program and then it wouldn't be in place for when we do one day because we will one day increase the numbers that we are inviting into our nation. I, I believe that we will do that. Um, so we need to maintain our, our programs of support, and that includes our resettlement. We have a really good relationship with World Relief, who does most of the resettlement uh, in our community. We need to ensure that our schools have sanctu our sanctuaries. So that means that we can assure to our students and their families that uh, immigration will not come in to our schools. They will not stop buses, because there have been communities in which that has happened. Um, uh, we also need to make sure that without calling out specifically who our immigrant students are, we need to make sure that all stakeholders, every single person within a school system and the families understand the rights of immigrants. And, um, and also most importantly, that right to education because we sometimes get a, a loose idea of what that means. And it's not about just providing students with workbooks and a desk. It's about quality. It's about quality, mm -hmm. inclusive education in which they are not only learning, but they are also sharing their own cultures and experiences. And, and um, we need to utilize uh, curriculum and instruction that broadens our perspectives and challenges our perceptions. and. Um, helps us to understand that we are better and more beautiful and stronger the more diverse we are. Well said, thank you. Um, so uh, so we're going to open up to um, uh, questions from the audience in a moment. Um, but uh, so I would like to remind folks, particularly on the webcast, that you can email us at events at migrationpolicy.org or use the hashtag uh, MPI discuss or tweet questions to at migration policy. Uh, but Joan, uh, I wanted um, 
there's you've got a lot of wisdom stored up uh, from all of the capacity building uh, challenges you've taken on at a really high level uh, uh, of um, uh, policy and also program administration trying to bring the right range of services together in the early childhood space and have them be sensitive to uh, diverse families. And, and we really appreciated the uh, time we were able to spend working with you and the Transatlantic Forum on Inclusive Early Years where uh, there, there was a very deep dive trying to think about um, how to have systems, uh, how to have those systems be real in terms of uh, the that they did not know how to speak the languages of families and that uh, that they really had to go, you know, a lot more than the extra mile to try and um, try and reach these families. Um, so but but please just say a little bit about what sorts of promising uh, initiatives you've seen, because because I agree with you. Well, first of all, obviously, about the promise of the early childhood space uh, in terms of what it can and um, the way it can close gap for children. And we also believe for um, immigrant families in particular, because parents are the ones who were um, mediators of all the services. So you're you're helping the integration of the entire family, not just children. Uh, but also that those are systems that are really on the move and forming. So you're catching them at their formative time uh, as well. But so if you could if you could um, send us into the Q and A just with um, some examples of sure. um, of initiatives that you think folks should have in mind as they think about um, about the kinds of responses you want to see uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, what the GEM report raises in the early childhood space. Well, before I do that, I want to go back to a few of the comments that Mary and Mandy made. I was made. surprised you didn't jump in I when know, people were making really them. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that to watch the country go from pride around immigration to fear has been, I think, particularly difficult because we have such a history um, that we can build upon. And I do agree with Mary that the hope of all this is happening in communities across mm -hmm. the country that somehow the divisions are being um, uh, the divisions are being bridged and that in many places um, we're seeing positive signs of civic engagement bringing people mm -hmm. together and I think that's really exciting. It has been difficult I as you know was in the agency that had the refugee resettlement program. We were very proud of the uh, the collaboration that we did between refugee resettlement and early childhood um, to do a whole range of activities. Um, and the refugee resettlement program has always been something that I think during the Transatlantic Forum, I remember thinking we could be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's so important for that mm -hmm. to continue to be strong and for us to build upon it. Uh, on the other side of the community, I think given where, where we are in the release of this report, we should recognize the importance of U.S. investments in USAID's education portfolio. They just uh, released their new education agenda, and we need to all work to continue to grow that with a special focus, of course, on this population. So what I'm seeing across the, the world on the early childhood side are signs of hope. Um, I think the Sesame Street International Rescue Committee effort um, that won the MacArthur 100 and Change Prize to take media messages, home visiting, and preschool um, in response to the Syrian refugee crisis has been very exciting to watch. And I would say that it has raised the visibility of the issue in many of the hot spots around the world. And we're dealing with a lot of them. I mean, not only are we dealing with what's happening here and um, in response to the Syrian crisis, but the Rohingya crisis, the crisis that was mentioned in the video um, in Colombia and Brazil with the, with the migration from Venezuela, the many effort, the many uh, crises that are going on in the uh, African region. So there's a lot to focus on. What I'm seeing is um, the promise of looking for young children, looking across sectors and assessing needs for that age group, not assessing needs for child protection, for health, for education, but looking across those sectors. 
comprehensive planning for family-centered programming, mental health and social service supports, and all of those done, I think, in a way that respects, has to be done, not always done this way, but that, as, Ma as Mandy said, respects the languages and the cultures of where the children come from, um, and build services into the host communities. The way you keep communities together is to deal with the whole community, mm -hmm. and the needs of the host community are, are uh, terrifically important. And then finally, I think building on platforms so that you can address this issue in multiple settings, not just in specialized programs. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I could say a lot more, but I'll stop. Great, <laughs> great. All right, so I think we're ready to, um, to go to audience questions. And we have a few quick hands up over here. So if you could just please state um, uh, your name and organization. Yeah, hi, my name is Jeff Weintraub. I'm a consultant to Global Partnership for Education. I think this is a question mostly for Dr. Joshi, but others can chime in too. You mentioned a few minutes ago that um, in countries like Chad, Uganda, Ethiopia, um, there are some interesting progress, there's some interesting progress being made in terms of making the education there for the refugee children more inclusive. I think that's interesting because, you know, notwithstanding what we've just been talking about, the you know refugees in the American context, um, you probably know the number off the top of your head, but the vast majority of refugee children are being hosted in countries that uh, are low income and can barely uh, afford to uh, give good education, you know, proper education to their own children, let alone all these refugees pouring in across the borders. But what does that look like? The uh, um, how are they? Uh, being more inclusive with these refugees. And I have a quick second one, which is that, um, as you know, the percentage of money going to, um, uh, to education in humanitarian contexts is, is only about 2% over the last you know, decade or so. Have you seen in recent years any uh, substantial change in that number? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. inclusive education systems. What it means in this context is that they're not set up as parallel systems. So one of the things, and but of course, you know, all of these things are in progress. So um, in Turkey, what I had shown earlier was the, was the progress from sort of segregated classrooms to uh, a promise to have more integration, to, you know, that people will learn together. It is not easy, because if you look at the details of what we cover on Turkey, uh, there's resistance by the host community the, you know, the, like integration, I mean, the, the fact that you're learning together has resistance, you know, it causes resistance. But that is the promise uh, that, you know, because again, these crises are viewed as protracted, these are not viewed as short-term situations. So uh, Chad, I think one of the examples we mentioned about Chad was that some, um, a lot of the sort of temporary shelters or camps are being like transitioned into public schools. So actually, you know, under the umbrella of the government system. So that kind of inclusion, so that it's not parallel, again, not a parallel system. For Uganda, what, I find, what is actually quite interesting, and I think it relates to your second question about humanitarian aid, is the, the, the country, the development partners, everyone's come together to sort of propose projects that are now speaking to both the refugee uh, population as well as the host community. So one of the recent uh, sort of projects has been, you know, so. Every, all the development partners are coming to the table together and the country's coming to the table. And um, I think one of the last proposals was to, you know, with the objective of reaching 650,000 people, so both refugees and host communities. Because, you know, once you start going into this literature, you see that it's not like the host communities, as you mentioned, are in, you know, a much better situation. Um, one of the things that just struck me when, you know, just by m mentioning this was, um, one of the real challenges that I see, which we don't talk about as much internationally and which we need to do better about, even, and we will take this further in the next report on inclusion, is whenever things happen within borders, there's far less attention. So the fact that, you know, it's only when, because I feel like the refugee situations or the border 
transition situations are really the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Venezuela move only becomes an issue once people start crossing borders. Um, similarly to the Syria crisis or any of these crises, the, the number of people that are displaced within their countries vastly outnumbers the number of people who actually make the border change. It's similarly, it is the reason we also focus on things like internal migration, because you know it's not like, these are blurred boundaries. Uh, poverty, uh, like when does it become a, a choice? When does it go from a choice to forced displacement? You know, these are, it is the reason we have tried to be comprehensive because we don't think of these as very siloed issues. So what we see is encouraging. We see a little bit of movement towards inclusion, like the Turkey to the Syria, the integration of the Syrian refugees into the system. We see some inter interesting things like the Uganda case. Uh, we see some interesting movement on the aid situation. Uh, we've talked about how it's, uh, it seems like there's been ma major movement, and you can see it in the finance chapter. There's a, there's a big section on this. But um, where the main point is that we've been talking for a long time about how this 2% or the 4% or whatever it is, you know, whatever the aid to education is, needs to keep increasing. But that is not the solution. Because you know, once you go down that path, um, in the end, it's really about splitting small and small pieces of the pie. What we need to do is think about the more sustainable situation, like the Uganda solution. Um, but again, you know, once you go into the details, none of these things are perfect. But that is the, I think, we see, we see a transition happening in the aid situation uh, for, for humanitarian issues. Great. Yeah. yeah. Great. I know we had another question here. Thank you so much. Thank you all. My name is Jennifer Rigg. I'm with the Global Campaign for Education US. And we're actually about to launch in partnership with Results and many other organizations, policy recommendations tied to the Right to Education Index. And for the first time ever, because of the crisis at the border, we wanted to include recommendations for children and families that are detained. We have had, to be honest, our researchers have had a tough time even getting information about the status of education for those children and families. Although there is a concern that the type of integration that you're talking talking about with public education systems literally within yards geographically is not happening. When education is being provided, we hear it's through for-profit providers, um, which is concerning. So I wanted to ask all of you, what would your recommendations be on this front? And what changes do you think can happen right here in the United States to help um, young people who are not getting access to education while they're detained? Thank you. Um, can I, is it okay if I talk to you? So um, this is a near and dear to my heart right now, and um, I'm actually working. I would love to talk to you after this. <laughs> but um, so I, I think this is a really important piece of the of what we're talking about here, because the detention of these detention centers down at the border, particularly those which are housing only children, um, are actually indirect, it appears, violation of, the, of what's going on in the GEM report, even based on what we heard this afternoon. Um, because it, it does not appear that this, the children down at the, in the border camps are being afforded a quality education. Uh, and so I actually am working right now on a campaign with other teachers to bring more engagement with this here in the United States because it's something that we've only been experiencing for um, a handful of years. Uh, and it seems to have increased dramatically over the past um, six months or so. Uh, and so this is something that I think uh, one of the major things is that we need to come together, particularly in education, particularly educators, to uh, create a single voice that is demanding that these kids not only have access to education, but that they uh, be free and be allowed to attend school with their peers here in the United States. Because it is clear that um, all, all children deserve an education. All children have endless potential and deserve to reach that potential. And most importantly, all children deserve to be free. Um, yeah. I would just add, is there someone here from the Young Center? Because I know that's their main line of work. We did have an RSVP from them, but maybe we can um, connect you with them because that's this is pretty much what they do full time. But I guess I would just say from our experience um, with the um, late arriving um, student, well, we 
call them late arriving because uh, with a lot of the unaccompanied, um, well, so-called unaccompanied children, they were um, uh, they were arriving in their middle and high school years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, a lot of school districts were they were already underway in the school year. They mm -hmm. might not have had seats. They might not have had teachers. Um, uh, just a lot of capacity building issues. So. I would say um, just that with um, with uh, expansions of commitment to service needs to come funding for it because mm -hmm. I think there were part of the um, part of the blocking of buses and the like. I think there there is a um, uh, needing to address both sides of the equation. I would just say because in a lot of places there is some capacity to build on, in other places there isn't, um, and um, and I think uh, you know too often uh, at the federal level we walk away from um, the costs that wind up on yeah. states and localities, which is part of the issue with the um, lawsuit that was brought against the refugee resettlement program overall, seeking to challenge its constitutionality, where um, Tennessee, for example, had kind of kept track of their Medicaid costs and their English language learner costs and said, how are these costs the responsibility of Tennessee taxpayers and not all of the US if the refugee program right. is an international law commitment why is it not paid for at the federal level? So I think part of sort of um, calming the waters is to really have some honest conversations about um, cost sharing and and uh, you know who's um, who's going to look after because uh, uh, just because of the um, the prominent role that education plays in state and local budgets. Yeah. yeah. Um, so other um, questions from here. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be getting stuff over the. Okay, good. So we have. Um, maybe we can go to this side of the room. Sorry, other comments yeah. first, and then we'll take the question. Yeah, I just wanted. Do you? Yeah. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just uh, thank you for raising it, Jennifer. And I, you know, I think number one, children shouldn't be detained. Right. Um, and they should be in host communities. And uh, but I also think um, Margie's point about cost sharing. What causes the tension is when you don't have resources. So that's important. I would urge in our look at what's happening to the children on the border to pay particular attention to the children with special needs, mm -hmm. because we know so very little about what's happening with those children, and mm -hmm. and they have a special right to education. So you know I think. Um, raising awareness from the teacher point of view is uh, is particularly important, but I think we should be pretty clear that children have a right to education and, and detention is not the answer. Right, exactly. I would completely reiterate that. Family <laughs> detention, uh, it really should be ended. And we, but one of the things that I think it's really important to remember is that in the context even of sort of a short-term processing of families there are going to be needs for children and ideally these things the processing moves quickly when it doesn't though there have to be short-term um, uh, services in place that i think keep children engaged and keep mm -hmm. them um, uh, focused on the future so I, I think that's a tough balance because there are times that under the best of circumstances you, you find yourself in these situations where children are uh, unaccompanied minors who are in, in foster facilities and and aren't able to quickly reunite there's like a whole range of situations and I, I certainly know that at times ORR uh, you know worked very hard to try to provide quality education in those shelters but it was never with the idea that this was going to be a long-term okay. solution and that's what's I think so difficult about one of the challenges or one of the questions you're asking is that you know these children are in in this strange moment in time where somehow or other uh, we're supposed to be providing for all of their needs and yet we're doing it in a context that is completely inappropriate for for children yes. and so I you know I welcome your recommendations but I think it's got to start with you no know, family detention mm -hmm. yeah so I think maybe we had um, two hands raised if we could take both of those questions and then as part of um, responding to them we'll also just invite the um, uh, speakers to um, provide any final um, remarks. We'll start here. Hi, I'm Heidi. Oh, sorry, Heidi Faust from TESOL International Association. So we're a teachers association for teachers of English to speakers of other languages. And so my question and maybe also a seed to plant in the room would be this notion of um, teachers who are displaced and coming to the United States 
as an asset to our public schools with cultural knowledge, with linguistic knowledge, um, as our content teachers encounter English learners and our English language teachers encounter um, English learners from multiple countries and, and spaces, there seems to be a need for teachers like that. And so I'm wondering, my question would be, is there a way to identify who those displaced teachers are coming to the US and to pair them with our public schools somehow? Um, and is there any kind of um, research done on who they are, what they're doing, like how we might work with them um, as an asset nationally? And then uh, we'll take the question right here. The microphone's coming. My name is Grace Ann Lewis. I'm a grad student at Catholic University. And my question is, someone on the panel mentioned um, teacher competency. And um, one of the things that we're seeing in the research is that there is an increase in inclusion in the classroom in regards to English language learners and students with learning disabilities. However, there is an attrition in the number of persons entering special education. And within the universities, the tracks are normally generally general education for early education or special education. And the number of persons going into special education is very minimal. What are some of the ways that we could come alongside to support the teachers or pre prepare them? Because a lot of general education teachers are not very welcoming of children with special needs. Hmm. So Mandy, maybe we'll start with you since those are both teacher profession related questions. Yeah. Um, so just one of the limitations that I've recently talked to someone just uh, last week about with the um, hiring and um, of, of teachers from other nations is the visa process and the ability to retain those teachers. So what the experience has been is that they've gone into the school system. I know South Carolina relies heavily on educators from other nations and they'll come in, they'll get settled and then they only be able to stay for two, maybe three years. And so just when they're getting embedded within the system, they then have to leave. And so that's one of the things that I would say that we would need to address is this ability for an educator who has been displaced to come over to the United States would be to ensure that there was some sort of um, either ability to stay longer or another mechanism in place in, in order for them to actually be able to become part of the community. Because um, that kind of thing is difficult for the kids too, to constantly have um, shifting you know, teachers, educators. And then in terms of special education, one of the major um, issues with special education, one of the reasons that educators have a, have a hard time going into that particular facet of education is the workload. So um, we're seeing that it, it, a special education teacher, particularly one who is gifted, will have a caseload of like 45, 65 students, these mm -hmm. tremendous, huge caseloads that then um, it becomes impossible for them to do their job effectively. Um, so one of the ways that we can help teachers, particularly in specialized areas like special education or even working with English language learners uh, is because, and those are two wholly separate things because English language learning is a language barrier. It is not a, in any way, a language learning issue. Um, so those are two wholly different things, but we can ensure that we are supporting our educators and being able to actually accomplish the job that they are there to do. And when they're overloaded to the point of uh, pure exhaustion, that they, they can't effectively do their job, which then limits the number of people mm -hmm. who want to even, mm -hmm. even go into that field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's so many things in all of this, and I could talk all day long about <laughs> every, single one of, every single one of these topics and what it comes down to, and that we need to recognize, particularly here in the United States right now, is that children are children are children. It doesn't matter where they've come from. It doesn't matter, you know, we need to recognize that and we need to, you know, honor the cultures and we need to honor their experiences and their lived experiences, but we need to recognize that all children have the equal right to education and an equal right to life. And, um, and we need to be working every single day to ensure that all of our children, all of them have access to education 
and the ability to reach that endless potential that I talked about before. Great, thank you, Mandy. I feel like that's a great that's sum up, but I also message. feel obligated to let. Well, I, uh, if there's I any actually other think final remarks. that's the perfect message. But I, I just want to say, if we're, it's a great question, and if we're really focused on inclusion, then mainstream teachers have to be prepared to work with children with special needs, children from um, immigrant families, and we're not doing enough of that. I think in our regular teacher education, and um, you know, I, I also think. I loved using the term asset with immigration because I think that's what what that's that's really what this is all about is is diversification is an asset in the country and bringing people along to become teachers from those communities are important. Um, I think Mandy summed it up: honor the culture, make sure children have access to education. Mary, you good? I'm good. Those are great right. points. So Priya, um, we just are so delighted that we were able to be part of this important release and are, are eager to see um, where the report goes and, and digs its way into local policy and the like. Is there any any other sort of advice or mission charge you want to give well, us as part you. of Thank you. I'll ending? just yeah, maybe say just a couple of things. It's been fascinating to be here. It's been fascinating to actually see these you know, connections. I think the one thing I would want all of us to take away from this is we really are all, all of us in it together. And I think you know, the more we, uh, I, I would sort of put it to the US community to take this report as teachers, as educators, as people working in policy, and to see you know, the lessons that we are drawing on. We talk about you know, refugees, um, in dis uh, refugees who are disabled. We talk about teacher migration issues. We talk about pretty much everything that we've talked about here. But I think you know, to use it as a vehicle for more education on these issues, for more edu education in the classroom, education in the community, I feel like it really can be that kind of tool. It's not exactly a toolkit in that sense, but it can serve that purpose. And I think you know, we are eager to hear your voice if you want to talk to us back, talk back to us. You know, we have like a very, very um, what do you call it? Um, active comms, you know, communication and media sort of, you know, work that goes on around this. And it is really up to, I think, the people we connect with at the country level to take it forward, you know, because this is, uh, we, we have thought through the ideas that are out there in the academic literature. We've tried to commission papers from experts. We've tried to think through the things ourselves. We've looked at the data. But it really is, I think, in this interaction that we can really make it continue, you know, the, make the cause continue. So yeah. uh, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for your attention, really. And thank you for inviting us. Sure. Yeah. And thanks to all of you for staying. Sorry we ran a little bit over, but please join me before uh, we break for, to thank these wonderful um, uh, speakers and panelists for their work.